everyone for joining us this morning for uh, the visual and performing arts viewpoint of building a positive platform community and culture and utilizing routines and expectations. I'm Melissa Gano and I'm the District K-12 Arts Instructional Lead over Dance, Theater, and Visual Arts. And I'm Paul Robinson, District K-12 Music Instructional Lead. Yeah, our emails are here on uh, this particular slide, but you'll have access to our slide deck. We do have some hyperlinks. So feel free to copy, uh, email us at any time if you have any future questions or support needs. So, today, uh, when Paul and I were planning, um, planning this presentation, um, again, we just looked at this morning's general session at 8.30. Um, and we just built from the three essential questions from that general session. How might we provide equitable access and set up every student for success? How might we create a sense of belonging and a positive NTI learning community? And how might we establish and sustain routines and expectations to foster and elevate student voice? And so we're going to ad address those three essential questions from the viewpoint of uh, the visual and performing arts. So we begin with equitable access and setting students up for success, which involves both systems and organizing the NTI space for student learning. And this is sort of the equivalent to setting up your physical classroom. So there are things that are beyond your control, just like in the physical classroom, but um, those include for NTI, major system, we're using Google Classroom. It includes approved digital tools and programs, student and parent communication tool, and school schedule and administrative expectations. But let's focus on the things that are in your control. These things include organizing Google Classroom planning, uh, planning units and lessons, establishing clear routines and expectations, including community building strategies and activities, and communicating with families and providing timely feedback to students. For the arts, equitable access includes these four things, which we'll look at now. Arts teachers need to know student access and how to maintain art supplies, musical instruments, and equipment in order to plan instruction. What supplies and equipment do your students have to create, present, perform uh, with dance, music, theater, and visual arts? Is there or was there a plan to distribute art kits and musical instruments to students? And if so, what is the plan for maintaining these items once they're in students' hands and homes? Consider surveying students as to what they have at their houses that they can, that they can use also, some teachers have used a scavenger hunt activity as part of a lesson to survey what students have and can use, making sure the students have parental permission to use, of course. Next, in terms of equitable access, access to technology, what technology students have access to is important for all teachers to know, not just visual and performing arts teachers. The Chromebooks were offered to all, students, not all took advantage of that. So, do all of your students have the same access to technology, and what do they have? Chromebooks, iPads, or just phones? What about access to Wi-Fi? Are there any barriers or limitations, such as having to share a laptop with a sibling, or only being able to attend synchronous live meetings on certain days and times? Remember, our students are in varying situations, they're not all at home. Some are at daycares, community centers, or working from parking lots and cars. So do all of your students have access to the digital tools you'll be using? Nearpod, Jamboard, Collabora, and others. Some devices, keep in mind, cannot download or operate certain apps or programs. And all of these things need to be taken into account when considering students' access to technology. Okay, next, I'm going to talk about uh, instructional time, due dates, and the feedback loop. 
particularly for our elementary and middle school uh, vision performing arts teachers, they have to deal with the fact that they're seeing every student um, in the school either all in one week or in some period um, in terms of how the rotation is set up. We actually have probably just taking, for example, the elementary schools, more than 20 various schedules that are set up. Um, Paul and I did share, um, in terms of the district NTI plan, some sample schedule that students could use. But what's in your control um, as a teacher and for our visual performing arts teachers? So regardless of your school schedule, and no matter whether you're teaching elementary, middle, and high, how much instructional time will you have with all of your students and classes? Will the day of the week that you see students um, and provide synchronous instruction affect your instructional time as well as due dates? How will the day of the week that you have a live class meet affect a due date? So this is a chart that we provide to our arts teachers just because we have to look at the calendar uh, and determine how many actual class periods are you going to have with students. So here at the elementary level, uh, we are in quarters by grading period, so you can see they're not exactly the same. But more importantly, um, the second half of this chart is when you break down uh, instructional days by the day of the week, whatever day you see those students, even in the NTI world, if you have synchronous lessons, with students, um, certain grades or certain class periods only on Monday, uh, then, for example, this first two quarters up to winter break, you only have 16 class periods versus uh, classes that you have on Tuesday, you're going to have 18 class periods. So every year, whether we're in brick and mortar or NTI, elementary um, as well as middle and high have to look at actually how many class periods and how the day of the week affects planning instructional time and due dates for assignments. So this next slide is um, the same uh, concept in terms of information for middle and high. Again, just look at the second half, you know, if you have classes, um, synchronous classes on Mondays, versus Mondays and Wednesdays versus Tuesday and Thursday. Thursday, those do not equal out. Uh, mon uh, if you're on a rotation block, rotating block schedule, Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, Thursday, or red and blue days, however school uh, says that, your Monday and Wednesday students, middle and high, if you're following that type of schedule, you only uh, have for the whole year following that schedule, 60, uh, 68 class periods versus a Tuesday, Thursday schedule that you're going to have 72. So it's really important for teachers in planning and developing that system uh, to know exactly how much instructional time they're going to have with students. And with all of these, this is also going to affect due dates. So if you have, if you introduce a lesson with some classes for the week on Mondays, but you don't get to that lesson with another group or another class, until Wednesday, having the due date be Friday is not equitable. So visual performing arts teachers, um, as well as all special area related arts teachers, have to take into account of uh, making it as equitable as they can in terms of due date. So that may be a weekend due date, or the due date may be when they see them the following week. So, in terms of equitable access to assignments, there are uh, questions that all teachers need to ask themselves when they are planning instruction and setting up their cla online classroom environments. So, where are students going to go to find their weekly assignments? Do they immediately have to go to Google Classroom? Is it really posted on a Bitmoji slide that shows up in another place? For elementary, um, do they find, do they go first to their homeroom teachers to find that link? Um, also, you know, I do encourage any teacher, put yourself in the shoes of students or their parents and guardians and ask, how easy is it to find and follow a weekly 
or multi-week, aka unit, assignments. Um, where will live class meeting links be posted? I know this is sometimes an issue at the elementary level where, um, particularly for the lower grade levels, K1 and 2, uh, those meeting links might not be posted in the Google Classroom. They may be posted in the homeroom teacher, for example. But just know you need to have a system, a, and in this case, a routine of where uh, students and their parents and families know where to go to get information so that they have equitable access uh, to finding and completing work. Also, another thing is... Um, for teachers, uh, and working with visual performing arts teachers, since, for example, the elementary level, we have um, visual art and uh, general music teachers who have anywhere from 400 students to 1,200 when they are teaching truly itinerant, and they have two, uh, two schools. So definitely, teachers need to establish boundaries. When are you the teacher available? When are you going to respond to emails or questions? Um, are those questions coming solely through Google Classroom? And, and finally, when will you grade the science? The big takeaway in talking with my visual art and performing arts teachers um, and giving them advice when they've been totally stressed out about the amount of work is don't make yourself available 24-7. Set, um, set those boundaries. Another thing that I just wanted to show a couple of quick slides is going back to uh, organizing Google Classroom. I've seen um, several arts and non-arts teachers uh, Google Classrooms, and when you go to the classwork section, uh, assignments aren't, uh, they're not using the topic session. And for me, pretending that I'm a student or a lay person that's not uh, an educator, how does this make any sense? What week was which assignment assigned? So I uh, have definitely encouraged, you know, visual performing arts teachers to use those topics under the classwork section in uh, Google Classroom to note um, that day of the week that that, uh, that assignment or group of tasks have been assigned. Then you have the assignment, which this is art elements and principles of design. The other big important thing is where can students and family know what's expected without watching a video, opening a slide deck. So here in Google Classroom, since that's our learning management platform, do a short description there of what are those tasks for that, that week's lesson or lessons. And then list what materials, and particularly for visual performing arts, are they going to need a particular instrument? Um, for visual art, are they going to need particular art supplies to make art during the synchronous session or also asynchronously in creating artwork? Okay, Paul. Thank you. When it comes down to it, are you setting students up for success? We'll discuss these factors more in addressing the next two essential questions for this presentation, but we want to highlight a couple of them briefly. First, are you planning units and lessons so all students can be successful? This includes differentiation of both the content of the learning and the delivery of that content. Begin with the end in mind and consider how will, how will you support your students where they are in their various circumstances, understandings, and skills. When we are in person, also, you may get a few students from time to time who have no idea what your class is about or even a completely incorrect idea of what happens in your class. Now, you'll need to support all your students in understanding what your class is in NTI, which is a class for creating, presenting, and performing responding and connecting in your areas of the arts. So when it comes to planning units and lessons for student success, teachers should use the district visual performing arts curriculum frameworks. They should use the understanding by design framework to consider goals and assessments before planning the tasks. 
They should scaffold instruction and provide step-by-step instructions in student-friendly language, both orally and written. And this is based on research and the various student learning styles. Also, they should consider the format of their presentation. Don't cram too much information on one slide or document. Use a slide instead for each step of the task. And finally, make slide decks or documents engaging by using interactive tools and strategies. Slide decks or Pear Deck or Nearpod 2 can provide a multitude of interactive features from drag and drop to drawing on the slide. When planning for any online learning, reference the district strategic planning tool and on this slide, there are hyperlinks to the NTI strategic planning tool tailored for dance, music, theater, and visual art. That brings us to our second essential question. Let's address the importance of creating a sense of belonging in a positive NTI learning community. Here are some strategies commonly used by visual and performing arts teachers to create that sense of belonging and build community. First, there's getting to know you activities. You can design assignments or activities where students can share what they want, what they want you and their peers to know about them. For instance, all about me activities, my favorite things, um, things that discuss their identity as well as what they envision uh, for themselves for the future. And you can also use drama and theater games uh, in any classroom to build community and a sense of belonging. You can start low risk and move towards higher risk. Um, collaborative assignments are another thing that you can use. You can start with collaborative assignments where students pair up and then work towards larger collaborative group work. So it's starting small, building trust, and then expanding. Again, start with lower risk and move toward higher risk. We also want to make sure our students are the driver of our learning. And there's some ways that we can do this. We can identify common student interests. You can do this by a survey about student interests or having students determine topics or themes for assignments. Students can brainstorm themes for units and lessons, and not only does that give them ownership, but it also helps them find commonalities amongst their peers. You can also utilize students to um, co-plan uh, projects, and you can train students to lead activities, especially routine activities. Positive peer assessment and feedback is another strategy. Um, critiques, peer feedback, and don't uh, forget to have clear expectations and routines for those critiques and feedback and practice them. Uh, an example of, of this is I notice, I value, I wonder. Positive teacher-initiated reinforcements and recognitions can be communicated to both students and their families. Uh, there's a, in the general session, uh, they went over teacher-initiated behaviors, and those can be used. Student recognitions can also be used, such as star student, student of the week, etc., making sure all students get recognized at some point. And for elementary, you may be able to simplify by coordinating with the whole room teacher system for recognition and um, having particular students of, of a day. Another strategy is having a system for showcasing work and tasks. You can use Google Slide Decks, Google Sites, a YouTube channel, Padlet, and others. And these can also include uh, virtual and or live exhibitions and performances. 
And don't forget, you can always use non and or cross-curricular activities like community service learning projects, social time and events, lunch bunch, for example, or what my sixth grader calls chill time with friends that his um, teacher organizes for them. Asynchronous in-progress check-ins can also be utilized to provide feedback and comments beyond just written feedback, such as utilizing embedded videos and audio recorded feedback like most. And finally, anything you can do to create the sense of a physical classroom can help students feel familiar and safe. Virtual backgrounds with photo of actual classroom behind teacher desk and instructional space set up to look like a teacher's space. That can include posters, educational tools, objects, art supplies, easels, musical instruments and equipment, stage curtains, etc. These things can help the students feel like they belong. So well, the final essential question uh, that we're going to address is uh, about establishing and sustaining routines and the expectations to foster and elevate student voice. So these are almost two separate uh, practices that really work together. So first and foremost, establishing and sustaining routines and expectations. Uh, we've got an image here of a book it's really targeted towards elementary though it's uh, many of the much of the information within that which includes routines uh, expectations and various strategies in setting up a positive classroom or a responsive classroom um, environment is applicable to middle and high and it's also the information that is adaptable to the nti environment many of our elementary teachers have actually uh, participated in a B, uh, PD where we did a book study utilizing that book last year. So, teachers need to intentionally plan what, what the students and they, the teacher, are going to be doing to synchronous learning. So, it's utilizing that classroom instructional framework for the visual and performing arts really and truly that looks almost the same as in the NTI environment. So what are what is the teacher doing with the students? The, or how do the students do the moment that they show up to the synchronous live class meet? Um, how are they introducing um, a new lesson or a new concept or technique? Um, how are they demoing work, which many of you have probably seen, particularly for um, my visual arts teachers, uh, they've got like three um, three screens going plus a camera uh, that's face down so that they can demo uh, a drawing or painting or construction, uh, sculptural or ceramic kind of technique uh, to show students. Or for the performing arts, everyone has seen, you know, the, the slew, the Brady Bunch screens of multiple students who are performing um, together. Make sure that um, we're making sure that our visual performing arts teachers are, are, are really clear about what routines they do need to create in the NTI world and what they need to do uh, in terms of continually, continually returning and practicing those particular routines. Uh, this also includes how they're managing that online physical learning space or the, the physical learning space that the students in themselves um, and also using nonverbal signaling as well as students um, again the, our teachers any teacher needs to return to these routines every time otherwise why call it a routine we're also encouraging particularly for elementary um, special area teachers which include our um, visual arts and general music teachers is to coordinate and connect with the students' homeroom teachers and see what are those rules and routines and take those into consideration when they're making their routines. They might just want to use most of those or particularly in terms of, you know, you know what's your starting um, routine? What do you do when you're, when you're beginning instruction um, in a particular content area in the homeroom? 
And then the other thing is keeping it fun. Um, so many of our many of our visual performing arts teachers, you know, were really good at performing. So um, they'll incorporate singing. They'll incorporate um, some acting, some call and response within these routines. One. It's a great mnemonic device in terms of getting it into permanent memory um, in any content area, but also in terms of the arts, it's important for our students to, again, um, be performing. The other thing is with our visual performing arts teachers, we, we have actually a fair number of routines because we have many different processes and techniques, and each of those may come with a particular routine of uh, either, either behavioral expectations or technical expectations. expectations. So, so our teachers have to start, just, just like any teacher, teacher should, should be starting small with just a couple and then add them over time, time as they come to that new concept or technique that needs its own routine or set of expectations. Um, also, kind of going back to organizing, the teacher has to have their own routine um, and, and convey that to students and their families. families. When, when are assignments going to be posted? When, when can they access those? And then how will the students submit work? This is huge for visual performing arts because we have artwork that's being photographed and teaching kids how to photograph work and how you upload it. Are you adding it to a Google Doc? Are you adding it to a Google Slide Deck? Um, are you doing recordings? Are those recordings also, for example, going into a Google slide deck, or um, is the work is in some cases just for ease of viewability? Are you using some other digital tool like maybe Padlet for the student to upload work to look at um, for a particular assignment? But knowing, have, knowing having the, the students and the parents know. This is where I go and when I can access the sign so I can do them synchronously and or asynchronously and how um, I, the student or the parent or sibling or someone else who is assisting, particularly the younger students, how am I going to submit that work? Um, the other thing is for visual performing arts, we, we definitely, say for um, non-arts content areas, we have routines for independent and collaborative work. We utilize, um, students have to know how to work together, particularly for the, the three performing arts, dance, music, and theater. Those real, I mean, you don't typically have people working solo in isolation, which in visual arts, you have that happening a fair amount. Um, but for performing arts, students, you have to build, again, trust, uh, utilize the various techniques and strategies that, that not only Paul and I have included in this presentation, but in the general session, and even some of the things that uh, the other content areas have brought up work completely for visual performing arts as well. Next, fostering and elevating student voice in a visual performing arts. So there's four big things that uh, we'd like to really focus in on when we're talking about how we're using routines and procedures to foster and elevate student voice in visual performing arts. One, we got to create a safe space. Um, so as a visual art teacher, how are you creating that sense of belonging in a community when you have uh, new students, perhaps particularly at elementary and middle, or even sometimes at the high school level, a new rotation um, of students coming in? Uh, you're, you're having to start basically from scratch versus home or classroom teachers that are not on a rotation schedule. So how are you making students feeling safe to share ideas and work? For visual performing arts, students are really putting themselves out there. They are creating work, they're having to work um, to create performances for dance, music, and theater. Um, and when they're sharing ideas and working with others, um, we definitely want to make sure that we don't end up and create um, a situation that the student feels like they could be bullied. And that really is in terms of talking to students in visual performing arts. That's one of the main reasons why uh, they don't participate or are reluctant to participate in some things because they're afraid that they'll be bullied by other students. So we definitely want to uh, make that a safe space. Start with low risk, build high risk, as we've mentioned earlier in this presentation. 
And then and how much freedom, freedom do your students have to share in opinions and ideas? Is anything up for grabs? Is there anything unacceptable? I know in visual performing arts, we're all about, you know, creative freedoms, but there's certain things that are just unacceptable. We are not, we are not going to have anything that promotes hate. So that's in terms of all visual performing arts. You might address hate issues in some way through uh, creating a painting or creating a particular dance, but the key word there is promote. We are not going to promote hate. Scaffolding choice. You know, visual performing arts teachers need to definitely, and it's inherent within our art, within our disciplines that we are providing students choice. But we use a, we uh, we really use the gradual release model. We scaffold. Uh, starting with the younger kids, so by the time they got high school, and if ideally they've been having the arts as they should since kindergarten all the way up to high school, um, there should be that um, that's already built in by the time they got to high school about uh, being able to work with choice. You can't just throw everything at them. So let's say it's a visual arts classroom and you're doing um, following a pedagogy such as choice-based education or teaching artistic behaviors in visual arts. Those are basically similar, um, but a, one of multiple pedagogies for visual arts. Um, you know, if a teacher just ends up and immediately with the group says, oh, I'm setting up all of these different stations, you're going to create an artwork that deals with this particular theme, blah, 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 and it sets the kids loose. Then the next thing you know, which I have experienced it, where kids actually got into a physical fight fighting over materials. So you have to actually teach kids about how to positively and respectively participate in, um, in choice-based uh, learning. You know, there's also a place, I know sometimes, you know, I hear some people say, oh, there's just too much, uh, you know, the teacher I do, you do, we do. Well, in the arts, there's techniques that students need to learn that do require that. Um, examples, guided practice to learn various watercolor techniques, steps and movements to perform. Um, and then the third thing, providing opportunity, include opportunities for choice, self-expression, personal interest. You over use overarching prompts versus singular topics or things. What if all students don't want to create a work around the theme of social justice? What if instead you used a prompt or a big idea to have an artist address issues that matter to them? Encourage connections. Again, students need to connect to the lesson and task. Give them choice. Involve them in designing the lesson, aka selecting topics or creating prompts. Use questioning techniques to encourage reflection and investigation with all help. Students can create work with a personal voice and vision. In conclusion, we hope to have provided further insight into building a positive NTI classroom culture and community through the lens of a visual performing arts teacher. Take a look at the resources slide. There are some hyperlinks to additional visual performing arts resources from some arts organizations, which will support further learning on today's topic and the three essential questions. And with that, we thank you for attending our presentation and checking out the recording. If there's any questions, remember you can email us. Our emails were at the beginning of the presentation, which you can reference on slide two of this presentation slide deck. I want to thank Melissa Ganero for co-presenting with me, and I want to thank Jack Bosley for moderating. So everyone, thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Paul and Melissa. It was a great session. Um, I really... Um, like how practical, the practical advice that you all gave out with schedules and, and planning units and, and uh, just reminding them about those planning tools that are available to them. And one of the things that I was um, just reminded of, Melissa, when you were talking about, um, you know, the visual arts with photography and I added like video and digital art, uh, how that can be connected back into one of our favorite initiatives, uh, at least in the tech world with the digital innovation team, and that's STLP. There's a whole yeah. category of uh, uh, these items with STLP called DPOJ, it's Digital Projects Online Judging, and your group of teachers, I feel like, you know, STLP is for 
is primarily aimed at our um, lab teachers and tech teachers at schools, but uh, you all could contribute, your teachers could contribute so much there. So just wanted yeah. to remind everybody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, and speaking, speaking of that, that our, uh, particularly, I'll just speak to visual arts, arts teachers, we've, we've, we've got 41 K-12 visual arts competitions, competitions on average each year that students are participating on. Some of them are massive and huge and most prestigious. They deal with scholarship dollars at the high school level, et cetera. Even in this NTI world, those events, those competitions are still going on. And it's also applicable to dance, music, and theater. Kids are performing. Um, in community, state, and national events during NTI, and our teachers are working tirelessly to make sure students are uh, creating that work and uh, putting their best foot, best foot forward and showcasing quality work. Yes, yep, it's an important reminder to uh, that students are still actively doing all that, even, even in these virtual settings. So, so Paul, thank you, Melissa, really yeah, thank appreciate you. The Thank time you. and um, you all sharing uh, all your advice and insights. So um, appreciate it. Fantastic. Yeah.